got room for everybody. <laughs> okay, I'm going to try to uh, project my voice a little so you can not have to use a microphone. Oh, you still want to use that? Oh, okay. No, no, no. Okay. Um, last week, um, I didn't have the ability to bring up the document I wanted, which is some interesting kind of case studies, um, narratives by both Han Chan himself and then a Chan master called Xu Yun, uh, Empty Cloud, and Xu Yun's date. Anybody know what Xu Yun's dates are? Everybody knows he lived to be very old, 119, but what's his dates? Yeah, he probably passed away in the mid-50s, uh, and so is a, a transitional figure between centuries. He was one of the teachers of my teacher. Um, he, he specialized in all the schools, but particularly in Chan. So tonight I want to go in and together look at these case studies that he's talking, these two are talking about, and see what we can learn from them to illustrate where we are in the text. So if we could... Um, go back a little bit in the text, if we can do this, to this, um, however, because persistent wrong views have not been cleansed, we're back a ways. I want to go back into that a little bit to frame. Uh-oh, don't have it? Well, they're trying to find that. What I'm going to do is just sort of um, frame this a little. When we begin the meditation practice, um, it's a, it's a mind-body, intellectual, spiritual exercise. It's total and complete. We're, we're using our whole being uh, to cultivate um, the deepest capacity we have for wisdom and insight, which is said to be intrinsic, innate, inherent, and whole in every person. Because we don't use it properly because we, you could say, abuse it or neglect it, don't refine it, don't hold to it. It becomes seemingly lost to us or dormant. It's like muscles that atrophy from not enough exercise and use. The capacity for this fullness never leaves. It's always present but it can be immediately present and full, as in a Buddha, or it can be somewhat present and full in different stages of awakening of bodhisattvas and arhats, and it can be almost seemingly non-existent, uh, sometimes with us or uh, with people, uh, and then among people it has various stages of realization. So the, the essence of this is saying it's, it's the same thing in all beings. It's not greater in a Buddha and lesser in a person, but just more um, unobstructed, let's say, in a Buddha, and more obstructed in a person. Now, these obstructions are what I want to talk about tonight, because this came up in the text, and we've been working on this translation. What Han Chan is saying in the text is essentially this Buddha nature, this enlightened nature, though whole and complete in each of us, through our karma, through what we do, what we think, what we say, over long, long periods of time, we distort, we move it in different directions so as to tie it up, to create actually obstructions for its free flowing. And these obstructions are what he's talking about here. Essentially, they come down to two. Um, and we have however. So these frivolous, right before that. Yeah, you're on the right page. Just go up a little more. However, however. There we go. Okay, good. This is better than my memory for sure. <laughs> um, so the obstructions he talks about are of two. And I'm hoping, uh, Lauren, you'll help me with some of the Sanskrit here because they are technical terms. 
what's being described here is not sort of mystical and vague. It's a very precise science of the mind. Um, and the two obstacles he talks about are, the first one is called Klesha Varanam. And Klesha Varanam is referring to a Chinese fan now. It's the, the afflictions, we translate the defilements of the English. And this has to do with relatively coarse mental, emotional, psychological um, impediments to our full awakening, uh, negative emotions, greed, anger, uh, delusion, envy, jealousy, pride, hate, uh, negative doubt. It goes on. There's, there's quite a list. But these are traits and, and character malformations we can all understand that we wish we didn't have. I hope we wish we don't, didn't have them. And you say, well, I don't, but I wish others would get rid of theirs. I know, but that's, <laughs> that's called pride. Anyhow, um, <laughs> those he talks about as the cores. But then he goes into something that's a little more subtle, and that's what he's talking about here. He says, however, because our wrong views have not been cleansed. Now, he's not talking about klesha here. He's talking about a mental indisposition, <laughs> okay? And that's how I'm going to translate. Now, the Sanskrit for this, if I understand it right, is, is Dhyanaya Varanam, J-N-E-Y-A. And it has to do, literally translated as the obstruction of what is known, or the obstruction, huh? What is to be known. And this is what he's talking about here. And he says, because these wrong views haven't been cleansed, they cloud over our wisdom, and they generate illusory states and fancy notions which shroud the mind. And the mistake he's saying, and this is what's going to come out tonight in the case studies, we then take this to be something wondrous and profound, these projections through our knowledge field that we have uh, so clearly think that this is the way things really are. So it's actually a projection from our state of mind onto reality, and we construct a reality based on these mental predispositions or uh, preconceptions we have. And we get so absorbed, he says, in this we can't let go. Then he goes on, he says, uh, these notions, these frivolous notions, are projections of a shifting, unsettled consciousness, a divided consciousness. And this is called the thorn of views. And it's a result, we don't see things clearly. Our, our scene, our fundamental scene is distorted. It's um, uh, broken. And that is not the same as the coarse superficial ones he was talking about before, which has to do with the klesha. We are talking about, he says, a subtle, continuous ebb and flow, an arising and cessation. And this is called the obstruction of what is known. So he uses this phrase, and the Chan school has developed these two ideas of this is how we obstruct ourselves. We obstruct ourselves with these negative emotions, these psychological distortions of our personalities that over time become habituated. So another way of looking at this is the habituated kind of negative emotions that we've accumulated. Um, and this is something as human beings we just work on or try to work on naturally to get clearer and straighter and become more perfect people. This, what he's talking about, is a much more subtle uh, obstruction. And that's what I wanted to go into tonight. Um, there's two ways that I know of, and there could be more, so I'm hoping to research this a lot more, but there's two ways this manifests. One is the story I told last week, if you remember about the, um, it's a, uh, a very well-known scholar who studied all the text and really knows him well, um, has heard about this monk who teaches directly from the mind without the use of scholarship and so forth. And uh, he actually has more students than the scholar. And the scholar's a little bit jealous or envious of him. And so wishing to put him down, he makes a visit to him to show him that his knowledge of the traditions and the teachings is superficial, not profound like his. And so when he comes in, I'll repeat the story for some of you who weren't here, he comes in, and the first thing the monk does is put his palms together, and the scholar's thinking, that's right, you should venerate me, um, missing the point. And then he says, please sit down, let's have some tea before we talk. Uh, and he says, okay, sure. So the cup is there, 
and uh, the tea's ready, and then the monk begins to pour the tea, and he pours it into the scholar's cup, and when it reaches the full point, the scholar is reaching down to grab it, but the monk keeps pouring. And now the tea's overflowing the cup on the table, onto the floor, onto their shoes, and finally the scholar says, stupid, can't you see? The cup's already full. There's no more room to put anything else in it. And then the monk says to him, uh, in the same way, some people are full of their ideas and their opinions, and therefore are not able to receive anything. They're already so full. And this is one illustration of the obstruction of what is known. So we get ideas, opinions uh, about something, uh, and then we cling and hold to them as if they were some kind of absolute truth, and much better than others' ideas and opinions. Understanding these teachings, you realize that the holding of ideas and opinions in and of themselves, at best, is a temporary expedient for direct seeing. So this is where the Avatamsaka Sutra says, comes in and says, look, concepts, ideas, words, and language are provisional, are false. They don't directly get at what this is. However, the text says, we borrow the false to point to the true. And so the ideas and opinions, although they might be informed and they might be, quote, right on, at some point, they're only meant to point to what's true so you can leave them behind and not cling to the words and ideas and opinions, if you follow. The other type that I think, and I'm hoping that these case studies might illustrate, was one I hadn't thought about before, though my teacher had taught us this many times. And that is the one that Hanshan's talking about. He says, when you begin your practice of cultivation, if you have these kinds of views, uh, these, this obstruction of what is known, uh, often it's, it's a seed of wanting or seeking. This is at the heart of it. And that wanting and seeking in Chinese, it's qiu xin, the seeking mind, the mind that's searching and then leads to grasping and wanting and craving and so forth. This, this mental attitude, this mental disposition is one of the obstructions of what is known. In other words, you have this... Uh, mm, disposition to get based on a misinterpretation that you don't already have it whole and complete. So it's a series of steps where because you feel I don't have it, I'm, I'm lacking, I'm inadequate, um, I'm not enlightened, therefore I need to get it. And instead of realizing that it's whole and complete and all you need to do is uncover what's obstructing it, we add the mind that says, I am searching, I'm seeking, I am acquisitive, I want, I crave, I need. And this mind becomes then the obstructed seed that when you do this in meditation, various states will arise, which is what Han Chan's describing, and when they arise, instead of seeing them as dreams, illusions, bubbles, and shadows, as consciousness releasing itself and opening up, we see them as the trophies, the prize of our seeking. And this is what he talks about here, this, this obstruction, if we go on, and then he says, so don't vainly hope for enlightenment, though true mind is wondrous and perfect in and of itself, there's nothing to long for. Um, but our false thoughts will harden and congeal, our state of mind becomes a struggle between the sense organs and the sense objects, and he's going on. So that being said, now I want to shift over to the um, stories, or maybe the case studies, if I could. So could you bring that text up? That's the one I sent you by email. Because sometimes I find it's, it's helpful to get the theory, but then to actually see how people who are practicing interpret and how they struggle with it when these states arise is, is pretty interesting. Uh, so the first part here, uh, yeah, first part is Hanshan himself. And... Um, He practiced sitting meditation really rigorously, vigorously, uh, for many, many years. And I had many, many states associated with this practice. And he said, although he had some teachers, he didn't have enough good teachers to guide him. And you'll see this again and again in the literature where monks and nuns or uh, people like ourselves set out to cultivate really sincere, really genuine. But we don't have really good knowing mentors. And so often, at that point, things arise and we're not clear which way to go. 
And so Hanshan said his mentor then, because he didn't have one directly, was the Sharangama Sutra. And he took this sutra. So when he had his states that would occur to him in the process of his meditation, he said to check them out, I would go back to this text and read it really thoroughly to the point that he memorized it. Now, you might try that. That would be an interesting um, exercise because it's quite a long text. Um, and every time he found that the text trued him, T-R-U-E-D. And I like this word because it's what you do with tires, I think. Like I had a uh, Franklin fix my bike up for me, and when I rode it, it was going, and he said the tire wasn't true. And I, I thought only people weren't true. And he says tires weren't true. And so he puts it on some. what do you put it on? You put it on something, and you adjust it so all the spokes have the even tension, and then the tire turns, it turns true, not wobbly. Uh, I really like that. I think that's a good uh, language to use for cultivation. We true ourselves. And when we're true, we run unobstructed, smooth. So he would use the shrangama to true himself, to adjust his spokes. Um, now, after he had quite a bit of practice and accomplishment, this is what he wrote. I'm just sharing this with you. And I'm taking this all from an essay I wrote a number of years ago on this. But the quotes are theirs. Obviously, this is not mine. So he said, at present, meaning when, everybody know when Hanshan is? You could say he's every Friday night here, but. <laughs> yeah, at present, meaning then, when he was alive during the Ming Dynasty, there was a lot of this meditation practice going on in China. He says, those who practice Chan are gathering on the mountain. So they have monasteries on the mountains, and you went into those mountains to have retreats. Why would you go to the mountains? Quiet, yeah. Higher, the air is pure, it's quiet, you're closer to uh, the nature and the nature that way. Oh, well, there's that too. That mountain, the feng shui the, of the mountain has, has special qualities. And, and then you have sacred mountains. So there's, uh, there's four sacred mountains in China that you can go and make pilgrimages to and visit and see if you can absorb that sacred energy. If you seek for it really hard, you'll get it, and you'll get enlightened. Yeah, I'm glad some people are going, huh, because that's not what the text is saying tonight. <laughs> enlightenment is not in the mountain. It's in your mind, <laughs> okay? <laughs> if mountains could enlighten us, you know, there'd be a lot of people who are Buddhas already that live in the hills, and there's not, Okay? <laughs> So, he says, they gather on the mountain, meaning they come to the monastery, to, and some achieve stillness of mind and a flash of thought. They are so predisposed that they can get stillness of mind just like that, and thereby experience great comfort. Translation of da zi zai. Okay, they get really great comfort. When suddenly all feelings of passions vanish, and that's the definition of comfort, by the way. It's very interesting. Great comfort is in this, doesn't mean all your passions are satisfied, but great comfort is all your passions vanish. This is kind of an interesting switch around, right? Because we think satisfaction or comfort comes from having our desires satisfied. Here he's saying, when the desires stop, that's the great comfort. The fire goes out and you're cool. You be cool, okay? It's regrettable that while sitting on the clean white ground, i.e. realizing the state of purity, they consider it unique and refuse to forsake it, knowing that it will become a dharma hindrance. This is called the barrier of the known. Now that's his translate. well, the translation of the same, the barrier, the impediment of what is known. So here what he's talking about is the barrier isn't, your, isn't the klesha because they're in the state now of stillness and purity. But the barrier now is attaching to the state, thinking that this then fulfills me. And so it's actually what he, the, the obstruction of what is known. I'm going to push the envelope a little here and say it's not just what is known, but what is experienced. When you have an experience, then you interpret it in a certain way, and this can become then an obstruction. Okay? Then he wrote, he's, and he doesn't quote who he says. He just says, the ancient said, and that's why I put here Han Chan's, quotes unspecified ancient masters who said, okay, you may reach the state of 
the bright moon in the cold, deep pond. Metaphor, right? Please, it's a metaphor. What's the bright moon in the cold, deep pond? Huh? Right. So the cold, deep pond is a pond of your, the water of your awakening that is cool because the passions are stilled. And when they are, the bright moon manifests completely, so clearly, because there's no waves on the water anymore, that you would make the mistake, and, and the story goes, and you reach down to re grab the moon out of the water, and you can't get it. It looks like the moon's right there in the water. Okay. So that's one state. They can reach that state without that state being, or the sound of the bell in the stillness of the night. Another metaphor, I'll let you ponder that. In the stillness of the night, when absolutely there's no sound, everything is incredibly quiet, suddenly, this is the yenching that's used, and that's that clear, bright sound. It's a metaphor for suddenly, in the stillness, your mind just has perfect clarity. Either one of these, these are both pure and still. Without that state being disrupted by contact with swelling water or rising waves, or without deficiency even in the midst of loud beat and peal. But you are still on this shore of birth and death. In other words, that state, however far out and however wondrous it seems to you, is still a state that will come and will go, even if you can prolong it for a long time. Clinging to the state leaves you still in birth and rebirth, which is what Han Chan was saying in the passage last week. Okay? So, even ordinary states where we get a little comfort, there's no more pain anymore, everything's cool, we're holding our recitation, even that, compared to these, isn't much. But these, compared to whatever Bodhi is, the complete, perfect awakening, these two, and the Buddha said it's like, and gave a metaphor, it's like a child offered chandala incense, pure fragrant incense, clinging to his little turd. So the Buddha found a child, a chi you know, yeah, I got your attention with little turds. If you don't know kids, you don't know kids like turds, okay? <laughs> uh, so the kid was playing, and he had a dried little turd, and he thought this was just the most precious thing. And the Buddha was walking with his disciples, and he said, I'm going to offer him black chandala incense that has the fragrance the gods go nuts over. And he offers it to the child, and the child says, no, no, I don't want that, I got my thing. And the disciples all go, oh, what funny child. And the Buddha said, in the same way, you that cling to temporary states of awakening are like the child clinging to the turd <laughs> and miss the fragrance and, huh, who, us? Yeah. So this is an example from the teaching. Yes. If that's the furthest you go, that's okay. <laughs> Light praise. <laughs> Mark, right? Mark asked last week, well, then should you not, what was it about, you use paranormal. What was your question? Um, uh, deny, deny them, right? Or deny these paranormal. Actually, the formula is something like this. Do not seek them, do not shun them, and do not keep them. It's very interesting. So you didn't seek it, and you don't want to shun it and crawl in a hole, but you don't want to go, whoa, <laughs> I have arrived, <laughs> which means to try to keep it. So it arises, you note it, and you let it just go as it goes. This is the Shurangama's advice for all states that have to do with meditation. Do not seek them, do not shun them out of fear and anxiety, and do not keep them. Just calmly watch their rise and fall, and you will continue on in your path. It's when you think you've got something or you fear you've lost something that the obstruction of what is known then kicks in and you get stuck. So, now I want to go, well, we have some time to this passage. Um, yes? So, like, A little louder. Yeah.
you just calmly watch the rise and fall of these states, and you calmly observe your own growth and development and let it happen without making judgment on it, without trying to cling to it, without giving it a grade A, B, C, and D, or have to repeat or anything like that. You just take it naturally, zhiran. Because actually the thing that would cause alarm and what should cause attention is the unawakened state. In other words, the awakening, the awakening state, because it's our natural, it's our birthright, if you want to use that language, we should not have, you know, great excitement and whatnot as we just become whole and complete as we are naturally. It's the unawakened that should have caused us to be a little more attentive and a little bit of alarm. Here I go getting angry again. Ah, well, wait a minute. Why not pay attention to that state rather than, oh, today I sat without pain and meditation, la, la, la. Because that's natural, but the anger is the obstruction. So actually by nailing those obstructions down with a little more attention, that's okay to pay attention to those until they vanish by themselves too. But what we normally do, we ignore our obstructions and our klesha, our anger, our jealousy and greed and whatnot. We just sort of like push them aside. We're really good at do I'm pretty, you know, good. We, you know, if you put notes on your refrigerator, you know, pay attention to your anger, it's like Clean the refrigerator, get this stuff done. But w looking for enlightenment, we're like the, you know, the cat looking for the mouse. Finding our faults, it's like blind man with a stick, you know, bumping anything. So what we want to do is turn the attention you know, to the abnormal, which is the klesha, and let the natural just go unnoticed in a sense. Yeah. So now if we look at Xu Yun, and he's, uh, mean, empty cloud, I give a little preface to him. Xu Yun, by the 35th year, by the time he was 35 years old, was already renowned for his meditation skills, living deep in the mountain wild, subsisting on pine needles and mountain stream water. Okay? His hair and his beard grew long, over a foot in length. Uh, if you've seen pictures, actually we have pictures of Xu Yun at various stages in his life, and sometimes you'll see him with his head shaved, looking like a Chinese big shoe, but other times you'll see very long hair and a long beard uh, and long nails and his patched robe, which is almost falling off just because it hasn't been taken care of. When he went in and he practiced this kind of meditation, he, it's called um, um, forgetting, wong, zuo wong, sitting forgetting. <laughs> This is, a, it's, it's a Taoist Buddhist meditation. In other words, you just pay attention to nothing. You don't cut your nails, you don't cut your hair. Um, eating is, you know, not too important. You stop sitting for a while, you think, hmm, maybe I should eat. Okay, and you go get some pine needles or pine nuts and water. And then that's enough and you go back to your sitting. Uh, you don't have any communications with the outside world. You are unplugged. So this is Buddhism unplugged. You unplug from everything. And you, Tso Wang means you, you sit into forgetfulness. This, it's a very interesting language here, but you pay no attention to anything. And so this is what he was doing in this type of meditation, and it's a deep kind of stilling. It's a deep kind of shamatha, of stopping and stilling. Um, and so... When he did this, his body became radiant and he had a piercing radiance with his eyes that more often than not frightened people. So people who cultivate this practice, their, their energy gets really full and their physiognomy becomes really quite... I don't know if you've ever encountered anybody like this. Um, you don't normally run into them on the street. You'd have to find them in certain special circumstances. Uh, when we were, I digress now a little bit, traveling with my teacher in Hong Kong, um, we were wanted to go up to one of the places that he had built by hand when he came from China. Came to China, there was, in Hong Kong, there was no support or anything. It was right after 49. And so he would every day go up to this hillside in Hong Kong, quite steep, on these stairs, hundreds of stairs, and carry bags of cement uh, and then um, sand and whatnot, and built this little place, little tiny, gosh, it wasn't really much bigger than this stage. Uh, cement walls and some windows, 
uh, just a simple place, to, an open uh, uh, place where you put wood to burn and make some food. Um, and at that time, there wasn't any water uh, there on that hillside. And so he just began sitting and sitting. And then one day, uh, as the story goes, he went outside and he took his walking staff and he just hit the ground, this rock, and the ground in the back three times. And shortly after, within a week or so, this water started to flow out from that area. Um, and he said it was really pure, clear water. So we had, we had known about this, so Hung Shur and I and others around Hong Kong is like, oh, sure, for sure, for take us up to the mountain, we want to drink that water. He said, oh, God, you guys. <laughs> no, no, we really want to drink that water. It's really special, you know. And we think, God, if we drink that water, we'll get first, second, third, third fourth, our heart, you know. And, and I says, no, no, you're just greedy ghosts. Don't, don't. It's not the water. It's nothing special. It was just, you know, a response, blah, blah, blah. No, no, we really, okay, okay. So up the mountain we trek. And then not thinking, you know, is this good for him who's getting older to climb these stairs again? But we're going up the stairs. And um, we come, and we open the, knock on the door. He opens the door, and this nun, young nun, comes out to greet us. And... To this day, I can remember, it was just like encountering a deer, a young deer in the woods. Her eyes and her, and her face were just so clear, and her eyes were so piercing and cool at the same time. I was just stopped. And she just looked at the master, and the master looked at her for a split second. She put her palms together, about, and she was gone. And I didn't see her for the rest of the visit there. So obviously, she was manning this place. You know, and it was a disciple of my teacher, but she was cultivating this kind of stillness. And that was my first encounter with someone like that, where I can recognize Xu Yun probably was able to have this effect on somebody because people would do this. Um, and you can even see it a little bit. If you go to a meditation retreat, and by the third or fourth or fifth day, you just look at people, you'll see that they look a little different than when they came in. Their face and skin is smoother, and there's a little radiance there. Their eyes are calmer and clearer. Um, it's very real. And it's, quote, go, huh? After one hour. Sometimes even just after an hour can be that quick. Um, and people notice this. Uh, and it's quite remarkable when people come in and they say, wow. But my point is, it's natural. That's your natural radiance. It's not cosmetic. It's your natural radiance coming forth because when the mind stops and the emotions are quiet, this natural fullness starts to return and you can see it. Um, another digression. Um, when I was a little boy, my father went on a retreat. He, was, we came out of a Catholic tradition. And so he went uh, to a retreat on this island in Lake Michigan. And this is in the Midwest. And there was a monastery out there. And he went on a one-week retreat there. And I was like seven or eight years old. And I was wondering, where's my dad going? You know? And he said, well, he's going on a retreat. What's a retreat? I had no idea what a retreat was. Um, and he said, well, you can talk to him when he comes back. So the day he returned, uh, he came in the back door. I remember rushing up to greet him. And I looked down and I thought, whoa, he's really different. His eyes were like platters, you know, and his face... Many of the wrinkles were gone, and he was moving much more slowly and more calm. His voice was gentle, and I said, what'd you do? <laughs> I was like, you know, like I, I was wanting to say, well, what happened to you? But I said, what'd you do? And that's how I thought as a kid. It had to be something he did. And he said, mm, he didn't do anything. I said, well, what? you know, I couldn't say you're different. I said, well, what did you, what did you do? I asked him again. He said, well, we didn't talk. It was all in silence. Uh, we walked and did prayers, and um, at lunch they'd read passages from the scriptures, and that was it. I thought, wow, this is interesting. You know, and so in ordinary ways and sometimes extraordinary ways, we can see this coming out in ourselves and others when the mad mind and the stress just stop. So anyhow, this is a description of him. Now, he wrote, and this is from his autobiography, I had many unusual experiences. Do we have this? Okay. Deep in the mountains and marshy land, I was not attacked by tigers or wolves, nor was I bitten by snakes or insects. Now, you have to understand where he was is not primo 
real estate. This is tough country. This is the backwoods area. Um, and there are wild animals that eat people, <laughs> including snakes and insects, and none of these bothered him. Uh, I neither craved for human sympathy nor took the cooked food normally eaten by people. So he's saying, I wasn't lonely, and I didn't miss the kitchen. Lying on the ground with the sky above me, I felt the myriad things were complete in myself. <laughs> I experienced a great joy as if I were a deva, a god of the fourth dhyana heaven. Since I'd not even had a bowl myself, I experienced boundless freedom from all impediments. So what he's talking about, is says, acquiring things is not freedom, it's not having things holding on you that you are free. The more you acquire, the less freedom you have, interestingly. So I know we, the first thing that happened to me with every retreat, I'd come home and, and jettison things. I'd go through my closets and garage and get rid of stuff. Because after seven days of sitting, I began to feel the weight of my possessions in my mind, not just, and so when I, and of course, then I was free. Within a week or two, they started to come back. I don't know where they came from. They started piling up again. <laughs> I do know where they came from. Okay. I experienced this boundless freedom. Thus my mind was clear and at ease, and my strength grew with each passing. My strength grew, not diminished, with each passing day. My eyes and ears became sharp and penetrating, and I walked with rapid steps as if I were flying. It seemed inexplicable how I came to be in such a condition. As there were mountains to stay in on and wild herbs to eat, I started wandering from place to place and thus passed the year oblivious of time. So he enters into the timeless space. He's entering into a space with very few food, and he feels completely free, and he's getting this light ease, this lightness in his step and everything. And he's, he reports other states that he has, too. And then he says, not until I came upon an old Chan master, Yang, Yang Jing, on the Hua Ding Peak of Mount Tiantai, did I get correction, he says, for what he called his weak spot. As he later came to describe it, this correction was based on the Sharangama Sutra. And here's the exchange that happened. So he's sitting there. He's having these far-out states. He doesn't really have a teacher at this point. He left home, I believe, at 19 years old, okay, and just goes off. The old master says, are you a monk, a Taoist, or a layman? Okay, and Xu Yun says, I'm a monk. Have you been ordained, he asked, and Xu Yun says, I received the full ordination. So he did receive his full ordination before going into the mountains. How long have you been in this condition, he asked. As I related my story, he asked, who instructed you to practice in this way? So he relates the above and much more. And then on this day, I was sitting, remember I told you the story that he, he crossed his legs and he felt he, someone had offered a yam? And so he was going to cook the yam, so he got the pot out, put the yam in the pot, and was boiling the water for the yam. And he said, well, I'll just cross my legs and sit here until the yam's cooked, and then I'll eat. And then... Like three or four weeks later, the other cultivators in the mountain say, well, we haven't seen Xu Yun for a while. We should go check him out. What's he doing? And they went in, and there he was sitting with his legs crossed, and there was no fire in the pot, and the yam was all moldy, and the mold was growing over the top. So it cooked and, and gone bad in three weeks. And, he, and so they tapped him on the shoulder, and he wouldn't stir, and they had this, the yen chain, and they went <laughs> like that, and he goes, oh, oh, I guess dinner's ready. And he looked down, and it was this moldy yam. So that was his state. So he relates this all to this monk, and you'd think the monk is going to say, wow, far out. <laughs> but the monk says, who instructed you to practice this way? <laughs> and I replied, I did it because the ancients attained enlightenment by, must, by such means and austerities. Cool, hung. He asked, you know that the ancients disciplined their bodies, but you know they also disciplined their minds? He further added, as I see your current practice, you're like a heretic and entirely on the wrong path, having wasted 10 years of training. <laughs> Whoa, there's his grade, report card. If by staying in a grotto and drinking water from mountain streams, you manage to succeed in living 10,000 years, you'd only be one of the 10 classes of rishis, immortals listed, and in the 50 states in the Sharangama Sutra and still be far away from the Tao, the path. 
Even if you managed to advance a further step, thus realizing the first fruit, you would only be self a self-enlightened fellow, Pratyeka Buddha. If your method merely consists of abstaining from cereals and not wearing trousers, it's only a quest for the extraordinary. Quest for the extraordinary, hence, um, what, what did we use? Miao, miao guo. So in Chinese, we use miao guo, which means wondrous fruit. We translate it as marvelous experiences. Here, a quest for the extraordinary. How can you expect such a practice to result in perfect enlightenment? Wow. So what he does is the older monk corrects Xu Yun, even though his states seem to be these. He's basically saying you are obstructed by what is experienced or known here, and therefore you will not progress. Very interesting. I'll just finish this. This is the last part to... Now, with the Sharangama Sutra as his guide, Shu Yun cultivated Chan for years in his 56 years. And remember, this is 35th. So, 21 years later. 21 years. Now, you all have been coming on Friday night here for what, 21 weeks? <laughs> so, give yourself some space here. 21 years. Uh, he apparently broke through with his practice. The details of that enlightenment are telling in regards to the importance of Sharangama teachings to his attainment. Here, in his own words, he describes an event occurred during a 12-week meditation retreat. One evening after the set meditation period, I opened my eyes and suddenly perceived great brightness similar to broad daylight, wherein everything, everything inside and outside the monastery was discernible to me. Through the wall, through the wall, I saw a monk in charge of lamps and incense urinating outside. The guest monk in the latrine, I saw him too. And far away, I saw boats plying on the river with the trees on both banks. All were clearly seen. The next morning, I asked the incense monk and the guest monk about this, and both confirmed what I had seen the previous night. So he didn't even trust that his own experience. He wanted to confirm, were you, in fact, urinating by the wall, you know, when you're da-da-da? <laughs> were you, in fact, in the latrine at this time? Da-da-da. And they go, yeah. Whoa. Okay. Knowing that this experience was only a temporary state I had attained, I did not pay undue regard to its strangeness. This is a really important line, I think. So now, with the correction that Han Shan's talking about, not having that obstruction of, of what is known, and not seeking for the marvelous and the extraordinary, the state still comes unsought for, not shunned, nor kept. He just said, I did not pay undue regard to its strangeness. Then he continued his meditation and later did, as he put it, the man mind come to a stop. He was able to cast off my last doubts about the mind root and rejoice at the realization of my cherished aim. He credits the Sharangama Sutra with instilling him the importance of purity and the consequent dispassion it instills. If I had not remained indifferent to both favorable and adverse situations, he reflected, I would have passed another life aimlessly and this experience would not have happened, meaning the awakening finally. So um, I wanted to bring this out to share with you sort of the case studies illustration of what Han Shan has been describing here and also bring up the, the nature of this obstruction of what is known because on one hand, it's not just the sort of intellectual preconceptions or dispositions that we have to see things in a certain way, which what the Buddha is describing is largely what we take to be reality as a projection of our thoughts, our minds, our feelings and emotions onto an external screen of sorts, and then we misinterpret that through that and call that reality. So that's a fundamental misinterpretation. I'd say that's better translation of avidya, is misinterpretation. That is one thing. But what's being talked about here, too, is the actual states that come about through the unfolding or opening of the true mind. In the same way, my teacher used to say, it's like a hose that you kink, and then the water can't go through at that point. And when you unkink it, the water flows through effortlessly and goes on its way again. But seeking something in the practice of meditation is like kinking the hose a bit. And so right at that point, things don't flow. They get stuck. 
And sometimes that building up of pressure feels like, wow, extraordinary. That in itself can feel, wow, like my chi is just, whew, it's getting, and you're going, wait, wait, wait. That's just the kink in the hose, and you're getting, wow, you know. So I, I, I bring this out to sort of provide this background that's really important for the meditation practice because you may feel as if you don't have a good teacher now, but if we use these texts and these case histories, you do have enough theoretical guidance to go on so that if and as these, if and as these things might arise, you have a way of discerning them and getting past them and not getting struck, you know, stuck there. So that's what I was going to illustrate tonight. Any questions? You'll probably have them and think about them, bring them back next week, that's okay. Uh, anything else? Announcements? So a Guanyin recitation session starting tomorrow night, Sunday. 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 And then on October one week. And so our some of our events here will be uh, canceled. For instance, we won't have the Monday class or the Thursday class. So people Oh okay. But we'll still have the Marty's class on Friday. Yeah, we'll still have Friday night class, those of you who aren't going on the retreat. Uh, the, by the way, the retreat is not here. No. Yeah. The retreat is up at the city of 10,000 Buddhas. Buddhas. Right. Yeah. If you have a chance to do one of these, um, do it. <laughs> That's all I can say. Uh, don't wait uh, and, and tell your retirement to do a retreat because by that time your body's going to be so creaky and old you'll be falling asleep through most of it. Um, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing when you're young. Um, and all of you look pretty young to me, so um, anybody, sometimes you think of doing a retreat and you get a little hesitant, you know, there's a little apprehension that comes, uh, and that's the apprehension of the obstruction of what is known. <laughs> it's also all your klesha going, no, no, don't go, we love you, keep your anger and greed and hostility, we love it, you know, and, and you don't, because you know you're going to have to change, you know, you know and so I want to get enlightened, but I don't want to change, so it's like this tension, and so just as the retreat gets closer, the voices get louder. Don't waste your time. You can do it next year. Uh, you know, it's cold up in the city. The food's not so great. You know, blah, 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 blah. And then you miss it. And then you miss another. And pretty soon, it's over. So carpe, carpe diem. Seize the moment. Grab the retreat. Um, how many people have done a seven-day here? Yeah, well, any kind. Seven day Chan going in, right? Did you have apprehensions before you went a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. And was it worth it? Yeah. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> Chan answers. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> no need more. <laughs> okay. We're going to do the transference in English and call it a night. Anything else? No. Okay. May every living being, our minds as one and radiant with light, share the fruits of peace with hearts of goodness, luminous and bright. If people hear and see how hands and hearts can find in giving, Unity, may their minds awake to great compassion, wisdom, and to joy. May kindness find reward. May all who sorrow leave their grief and pain. May this boundless light break the darkness of their endless night. Because our hearts are one, this world of pain turns into paradise. May all become compassionate 
and wise. May all become compassionate and wise. In respect to the three jewels, 